as Eric mentioned, and I'm going to walk around. I apologize. I don't stand still very well. As Eric mentioned, I'm Tom Henderson. This is Corey Hootman. Um, we're catching up with the new UST regulations. Many of you have seen one of the 10,000 webinars that we did this last summer uh, and fall. Uh, this will be a little bit different. We've con condensed this uh, pretty heavily, so uh, it, it makes it a little bit easier for you guys to swallow. If you've seen it, you're going to see some of the same stuff that we've done in the past. This is usually, well, so let's, let's go ahead and cover the objective. The objective here is that um, you'll be aware of the new uh, regulations that were adopted in October uh, for Title 23, Chapter 16, the UST regulations that are going to be at least as stringent as the federal requirements. Citations will be located at the bottom. This is usually the point where we, we start asking people, are you part of industry or if you're a, a local agency? Uh, but, but honestly, I, I, I don't mean to sound rude. I don't care uh, where you guys come from because this is really why we're all here. We're all here. This is that surface level of the things that we do. We, we need to make sure that we know these, these regulations. But as the water board, we need to protect the waters of, of the state. And, and for me, that means for the people of the state of California. Those, y'all pay my, my paycheck. I appreciate it, thanks. We can talk about a raise after I'm done here. But the, I work for you guys, and you all work for somebody else. So, and we all have that same motivation here, is that we protect the waters of the state. I don't want my kids drinking benzene. You don't want your kids drinking benzene. We all do a, a very good job. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I follow the laws to the, to the letter, and I'm going to teach you guys how to do that as well, too. So we're going to uh, learn the new UST regulations here. We got a bunch of topics. If you guys came for facility employee training, it's at the end. You'll have to sit through all the rest of this. But we uh, are covering a lot of new things. We've added new uh, diagrams to the to the webinar, as, as you can see, too. Um, we've added some universals to this, too. When we did this originally back in well, July through November, uh, we, we were dealing with a couple of different deadline dates. We had October 1st and October 13th. There were two different things that we were dealing with the feds. So it, it made it a little confusing. Those dates have passed. We don't really have to deal with that at this point here. You need to do these things at this point. So we'll, we'll talk about construction and upgrade requirements, uh, changes in the substances stored, uh, compatibility documentation, in-tank monitoring methods that uh, we've changed a little bit, forms and record keeping, testing and inspection, facility employee training, which has been a hot topic here, and some additional requirements that we have that are part of these regulations. So some of the universal changes that we're dealing with at this point here. Compliance is now done. We used to have annual, and we used to have years. We've broken it down. If it was something that was done in a year before, we made it all months at this point. And as you're all aware, too, the designated operators have broken down into days. We have a 30-day inspection requirement. Uh, another uni universal is testing and inspections are required within 30 days. We know that usually that occurs within a few minutes of uh, completing the repairs. Once the glue is dried, that's often done. But that is a universal repair that came directly out of the federal regulations. Uh, the 48-hour notification uh, is a, a new universal. Um, that we've uh, put on to everything that we do, uh, maintenance or maintain records at site, uh, and testing and inspection records are required for 36 months, all of them, compatibility documentation um, for as long as the, the substance is stored. So just to reiterate a little bit, these regulations that we, we are putting up here right now really came from the federal regulations. They're not new. Uh, we worked on it for two years. They've been in place now for five years. They're based on the federal regulations that started. Uh, they were implemented over time, but they started in July of 2015, and they were working on them for 10 years. So most of the things that you're seeing here, really, there was a long process to get where we're at. The feds made this change. We actually implemented it as well, too. And it's, it was a great change. It was one of the things that we were complaining about really for quite some time. If you did a repair, it, it was historically it meant something specific that, to a release. So that uh, a, a pipe or a tank actually 
squirted out into the soil or groundwater of, of the state. Didn't really quite fit what we were seeing these days. This came from some of the original uh, language that came out in, what, 84, 85, where everything was single walled. It really made a lot of sense then, but now that we have double walls, this has changed how we implement a lot of different things. In particular, we saw it uh, when we were double wall, we had double wall systems and we were doing linings on these. Uh, the, the fluid the, that the petroleum that was being held in, in that particular tank was leaking into the secondary. They were lining the system here um, and it wasn't a repair, right? It's, it makes all the sense that it would have been a repair. It wasn't a repair and so the question is, do we need to inspect it after 10 years, right? 120 months or uh, 60 months thereafter? So we changed this, this is a big deal. Um, a lot of things that weren't falling under that, that title of repair now actually do fall under that title of repair. So uh, now for any component causing system to be out of compliance. You'll see this in a couple of spots as we move through this here. Um, it's not the only, it wasn't just a, a lining issue or a double wall tank repair. So overfill prevention. Now this is one of those ones that, that when we spoke last fall that we had two particular dates. We had the October 1st and the October 13th. Since those are passed, it doesn't matter. You may not install, repair, or replace flow restrictors and vent lines to satisfy the overfill prevention. This does not mean that you can't put an over, or a, a ball float into a system. They can actually go in. They cannot be used for overfill at this point here. I know, I've, I've heard rumors, I don't know if this is true. Who's our air quality guy? that some air quality districts re still require a, a, a ball float. Uh, but if that is actually installed in the system, it cannot be used at this point. If you've installed it at this point, you cannot use it as part of the overfill. You can't repair this as well. Um, if you have a ball float that is set at 98% uh, at and you need to extend that down to its 90%, that's a repair. You're, you're modifying that device. It, it no longer can be done that way. So. Another one of our uh, construction and upgrades that we have is uh, we had a ton of questions on was the emergency generator uh, tank systems that they now require a line leak detector uh, for underground pressurized piping. If you have those two conditions, it does have to have a line leak detector. The difference here than, than our Chevron down the street is that uh, it may be an audible and visual alarm by itself. It does not have to shut down the flow now that doesn't necessarily mean that every time that <laughs> every time that this system actually does fire off that you shouldn't go down and look at it because now it's just an annoying thing, right? If it, if, if it was at a, a gas station, it would actually shut off flow. For, for your emergency generator system, it's just gonna set off an alarm and it's gonna be annoying to that person and they're gonna have to actually go down and look at it, but you need to look at it. This is one of these things that we, we made a provision, nobody wants to have their emergency generator shut off um, when the big one hits and you know we need that that to actually work uh, but this so this is one of the additional provisions that we've added here so in our office i i play this game with uh, our, some of my coworkers, and it's usually that I, I i get to see these odd pictures of people driving off with a dispenser still attached to the back of the car. And I get to send those to all the people in, in the group. But this one I actually got here recently. This is kind of a unique setup here. This is, we played Where's Waldo on this one here. Um, and this particular, this is a line leak detector. Uh, it may not actually be one that they can use in California yet, but this is the idea that we're actually seeing. So which part of this is the line leak detector? Can you all see that good? Dermot, what do you think it is? It's a, it's a, I set you up. It's all part of the line leak detector. So um, you have solenoid valves that are gonna be required. You have pressure transducers up on the top. You have testing devices down on the bottom. It's really a slick thing. This is one of those, the necessity being the mother invention. People are coming out with new stuff. Uh, it, like I said, this doesn't quite fit what we're doing here in California yet, uh, but 
but it does all the things that we're looking for. It sets off an alarm. This one actually can, can trigger to set off these solenoid valves here as well too. So it's one of the things that, that we're seeing with these new federal regulations because this isn't just in California that this has to be done. These, these emergency generators are, are national. These all have to be done throughout the 50 states. Most of the states had much more that they had to do. Spill bucket is, is uh, testing is new to most states in, in United States. Uh, sump testing is new to most. So we've seen new sump testing methods. We've seen new bucket testing methods. We've seen new line leak detectors. It's, uh, there's been kind of a boom. They still have to be tested um, through, through a third party testing to be usable here in California. We still have our requirements, but we are seeing a lot of new stuff that comes on the market right now. Single wall berry pipe. Uh, this is one of the ones that, again, it, it, this stemmed from the, the federal regulations. You may not repair or replace. Here's that repair thing again. So you may not repair or replace. You must upgrade the double wall uh, interstitially monitored pipe. Uh, this doesn't include the vent vapor uh, or fill, but if you have a underground pressurized line that has had a, uh, a release, you cannot repair it. On in those weeks up to October 1st, we were getting, it felt like thousands of, of emails and phone calls every day. It probably wasn't quite that much, but um, on my calendar I had for October 1st, I called it poop day. <laughs> I didn't really call it poop day, but that's what it said on my calendar. So I expected that day to be this barrage of questions and panics and, and so, but it didn't turn out that through noon I had one phone call that particular day. Someone was actually concerned about that there was new regulations that they had just heard about. So that was the extent of my morning. By about one o'clock, I had a, an email from uh, the, the local agency where I actually live, who is exceptional. Um, I have to, have to give them a little kudos there. So, but they had a gas station that was three blocks away from my house that they, it was single wall system. They were putting in uh, cathodic protection. They were putting in the new um, anodes for this particular facility and they clipped the line. They clipped uh, the product line for this particular tank. Um, and like I said, I know this facility well. It's right around the corner from my house. I don't necessarily buy a lot of gas, but it does have the coldest beer in town. <laughs> so they, they know me by name there. Um, but if they had done that the day before, they could have slapped a, a, a cover on this thing here, fixed it that way. That is not, not the case anymore. It was a very expensive timing thing that these guys ran into. But um, it, it turns out that they, they ended up closing this tank. It, was, uh, it had a turbine that was buried directly. They would have had to put new sumps on it. They had probably 300 feet of line that they would have had to replace on this thing here. This is part of that gentle nudging that you might be seeing with single wall tanks. You hear us talking about single wall tanks all the time. Their time is here, their time has come. Um, it's time to actually start seeing those close down. The single wall piping, if you have to replace it, has to go to double walled and it has to have continuous monitoring on it. Again, with all the thousands of questions that we had had, we didn't get a lot of compatibility questions, at least I didn't, did we get all? hardly any, which, means that either you don't understand it at all, you're ignoring it, or you completely got it down, which uh, I'm just assuming at this point that you do have it all, all down here. But we've changed a couple things in the change of a substance stored. Historically, you had to notify the COOPA, the local agency, after you had done the, the changeover, which didn't make a lot of sense if the substance that you put in didn't really match what you had. As far as your facility was concerned, it was rather problematic. Now it has to be done 30 days before in writing. Um, you have to identify the substance that's going to be in store, the date that the storage will actually start. And there's a series of documentation de demonstrating compatibility that has been expanded upon from what we had historically. So we've added this. Again, this came right from the federal regulations here. Uh, Corey cut and paste this one. Uh, Actually, it's not true at all. Uh, you have these three options here for this uh, spill containers overfill and ancillary equipment. You can use the independent testing organization approval. 
a manufacturer's statement of compatibility or a statement from a professional California engineer. So this is actually a pretty easy one to, act, to meet. You can probably find this on, online. Uh, the bar on this one's pretty low. The bar on this one here is really high. Uh, for you to actually go ahead and change the, the substance stored, um, for your compatibility documentation for a single wall system, you would have to have an independent testing organization approve the specific substance that's going to be put into that tank. This is a really high bar, and there's a reason for it too. These single wall tanks, are you're playing without a net for the most part with these single wall systems. Uh, they're, they're the oldest ones that we have. They're, there's a, there's some issues that we have with single wall systems. Um, and currently, the, this caps the, the substances that can be stored in the single wall system at B5 and E10, the, the, current, uh, the current blends that we have. So the UL testing organization, that would be something like UL. So if you wanted to put E85 into your uh, your, your tank that was put in in 1974, you would have to have UL come out and certify your system for that specifically. Again, very high bar. We're not allowing a lot of changes for these ones here. We've made some changes in uh, in-tank monitoring methods as well. Uh, in-tank, uh, the, the it used to be monthly that you uh, had to actually do this information and pass this on and make sure that you, you processed your testing on this. Leak detection results are required on a 30-day basis now. Uh, again, straight out of the federal requirements. SIR has to be a quantitative method. A lot, we used to have a lot of qualitative methods that uh, had a lot of hug feel that they were getting those numbers right. Um, and the other thing about the quantitative method is that your, your threshold uh, valve, your threshold value uh, can be no greater than one half of the minimal, minimum detection leak rate. So if you're, if you're detecting for a 0.1, that, that particular method has to do it at 0.05. Uh, and there are plenty that, that can do that. I know with uh, LG113, uh, Corey had taken a bunch of these qualitative methods out. Some of the obsolete ones here, uh, manual. Uh, inventory reconciliation, MIR as we call it, and manual tank gauging for small tanks. Uh, there, there is no manual part of those. There, you still can do, in one particular method, you can use manual. It, not for these ones here. <laughs> don't, don't be that guy right there. Uh, for SIR, you still are allowed to actually stick tanks here. We, there's so few people that are actually doing SIR. I don't think I've ever seen anybody. You, and I've been doing it for 20 years at this point. I don't know of anyone. Uh, that does do SIR, but I know that some of the bigger facilities still actually do this, and um, some of the SIR methods that, that have come out are, are pretty whipsing. They have uh, ones that can be done all online, and they do it all, all automatically, but they do still have that capability. They're the only ones that have that capability of sticking a tank right now. All right, forms and regulation. So, Many remember that day uh, of years past where we just had that monitoring system certification form. Uh, we've added a couple extra ones here. So the secondary contest, uh, containment testing report form is, these are all in regulation. They're all different appendixes right now. And some of them we're working on again, making some minor adjustments on it. Spill container testing report form, the overfill fill prevention, the statement of understanding, uh, the designated UST operator form, uh, facility employee training certificate, and the designated UST operator visual inspection form. So these are all documents that you must use. They're not optional. They have to be used. So, uh, uh, it, yeah, it's just not a choice at this point here. Some of the forms are... are uh, required to be uploaded into SIRS. So the Statement of Understanding and Compliance form, currently that is, they used to use the old combined document. Now we have these two separate documents. Now these documents don't need to be changed automatically. These, these documents are changed in very specific situations. The Statement of Understanding and Compliance is if you have a new signature, a new person signing for that particular facility, a new owner, operator. 
The designated UST uh, operator identification form is used specifically when you have changed out that, that designated operator or you have a brand new facility. There are situations where you have an existing facility that you're changing out the tanks, that you could po possibly using the same uh, UST operator. It's not required that you go ahead and make those changes at that point. So the documents that you have in SERS right now are good only up to that point that you make some kind of change. Both of these documents um, currently are in SERS under the owner statement of designated UST operator compliance. That name may change sometime in the future. Uh, it's the same location that they are right now. And, and then, like I said, in the future, it'll be two separate documents that you guys are storing in there. Those do not need to be changed at this point right here. Again, it's only when you have that change. Uh, these are the forms that are going to be required to be submitted to the Coupa. As we said, you have 30 days for submittal. This is one of those universals we were talking about. Um, monitoring system certification form, the secondary containment, the spill container test report, and the overfill inspection. Those documents have to be submitted to the, uh, the Coupa within 30 days. Uh, this isn't a whole lot of change. One of the things that we had had some questions on is some of the documentation that's associated with these things here. Um, we're looking at it. We'll work with that a little bit over time. But these documents must be submitted to the Coupas. Forms and record So these are forms retained on site. Uh, the facility employee training has to be kept at the facility. Uh, the designated visual operators. And as this is one of those documents that we've expanded to, it used to be that you had to have 12 of these documents. Now we're up to 36. Um, I'm sorry, is it 36 months? 36 months, yeah. So you need to keep 36 months worth of that uh, designated UST visual inspection. That could mean more than, it's, than 36 documents. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if most of you are doing 13 DO inspections per year. Uh, so the, the, it wouldn't necessarily be 36 documents that you guys are keeping. It could be, be more than that. Thank you very much. I'm going to switch this over to Corey. All right, we're going to move into testing and inspection requirements that are new because of the changes. Um, deadlines for, for performing testing and inspections uh, were changed to be calculated in calendar months for when they are due. This was to provide relief to owners and operators to not have creep happening when they were supposed to have that testing and inspection done. Tracking it in days meant that you were always either doing it on the, 30, the, the day that it was due or earlier, which then reset the period that it was due again. And so consequently, you would have testing and inspection moving forward in time constantly. Now testing and inspection is required during the month, uh, during the entire calendar month. So anytime during the calendar month that it's due, that's when it can be completed. Um, and for that tank facility to stay in compliance, a um, couple things to point out is that the period uh, begins the calendar month after the test or inspection is performed or required to be, for, be performed, whichever comes first. This means that testing and inspections occurring during a calendar month before the calendar month that it's required resets the period. And testing and inspections occurring during a calendar month after the calendar month that it's required does not reset the, the period. Um, the way the requirement is written, the important thing is to know that you cannot exceed the number of months set in, set in regulation. Um, and that's why you can reset it by doing the test early or the inspection early. But if you do the test or inspection late, you are now out of compliance with when you were supposed to do that test. So the test that gets or inspection gets performed, that is to bring the tank system back into compliance, but you revert back to the original date so that you are not exceeding the number of months set forth in regulation. So you adjust the, the time that this inspection or test is due by doing it early. Uh, to give an example, the monitoring system certification is required every 12 months. So if an uh, owner or operator performed their certification on June, June 2019, um, and then they choose to do it earlier because they like the weather in April better, better to do their certification. They can do it in April of 2020. That means that the next time that certification would be due is April 2021. 
um, a late inspection, say the owner operator performed their, their monitoring certification in June 2019, well they then performed, they didn't get to doing their inspection until August of 2020. Well that means that for uh, July and August they were out of compliance. They need to do that inspection, that certification so that they can come back into compliance. But the next time that they need to do that uh, certification would be in June 2021. So again, to readjust when that, that testing or inspection is due, you cannot exceed the number of months that, sets, that is set forth in regulation. Um, some changes with secondary containment testing. Um, if you're monitoring a component through vacuum pressure hydrostatic uh, fluid voluntarily, um, that does not need to be tested because t uh, monitoring it through vacuum pressure hydrostatic fluid uh, is a continual test on the secondary containment. However, if, if you have the option to not monitor that through VPH anymore, then within 30 days of discontinuing that monitoring, you're required to perform a secondary containment test to show that that component is tight. Um, as Tom pointed out, we now test and inspect uh, components that have been repaired and that test and inspection needs to occur within 30 days of the completion of that repair. Um, the results of the secondary containment testing uh, needs to be reported on the secondary containment testing report form. A, a copy of the procedures used for that testing need to be attached to that form along with any documentation that is used to determine the results of that testing. So if you're testing a sump and you're doing it hydrostatically, uh, recording the initial liquid level, um, recording the time that, that has elapsed between the, sec the first measurement and the second measurement, and the final uh, liquid level uh, would be what is expected as far as making, uh, as far as submitting documentation to show how you determined whether that was a passing or failing test. Uh, this form must be submitted to the, to the UPA within 30 days. Um, it is not something that must be uploaded through SIRS. It can be hand-delivered, mailed, faxed, or some other, other electronic methods. The owner-operator is required to retain this form for 36 months. Um, and there are links to these forms at the end of our presentation. Uh, the new overfill prevention equipment inspection, everybody's favorite new inspection. Um, this inspection is required to be conducted every 36 months and within 30 days after a repair to the overfill prevention equipment. The equipment that is used to meet the overfill prevention requirement is the requirement that is, is what is subject to the inspection. So if, they, if an owner operator has additional equipment that could have been used for overfill, only the equipment that is necessary to satisfy the requirements and regulation is what's subject to this inspection. However, equipment, overfill prevention equipment is listed in SIRS, and whatever is listed in SIRS is what's subject to the inspection. So only the equipment that's needed to be, to use, to be used to satisfy the requirement is what's required to be listed in SIRS. So all three of those, th all three things need to, to agree. What's listed in SIRS, what is applicable to their tank as far as meeting the overfill prevention requirements and what has been inspected. Now be aware that some USTs are limited to certain methods of overfill prevention because of the construction of their vent, vent piping and tank riser piping. Um, to summarize, if a tank system was installed after July 1st, 1987 and it does not have secondary containment on its vent lines and tank riser piping, then it is limited to using either a, sh a shutoff in, uh, flow into the tank at 95% or restriction of flow into the tank 30 minutes before it fills, provided that restriction occurs at 95% and an audible alarm five minutes before the tank fills. So those are the only two options that are, are available for overfill on a tank system that was installed after 1987 and has single wall vent lines or in tank riser piping. Uh, we do have an, an exemption for overfill prevention equipment. If you meet that exemption, you do not have to perform the inspection. The inspection is to determine uh, if the equipment is set to activate at the correct level and that it activates when the stored substance reaches that level. 
And so that is the criteria that the inspection method must meet in order for that to be an applicable method to, to determine those, those two items. The method of inspection is, is, a, is a hierarchy. You, you must inspect the equipment according to the manufacturer guidelines if they exist. And in the event that there are not manufacturer guidelines, then an industry standard such as PEI 1200 uh, would, could be used. Now, if, PEI, if you have a unique overfill prevention system and PEI 1200 doesn't address that type of equipment, then you can move to having a method developed by a, a state licensed uh, professional engineer. Um, one other thing I'd point out is if a manufacturer does have a guideline, but it doesn't actually satisfy, doesn't actually determine whether the equipment is set at the right level or if the equipment is functional, then that's as if the, the, the guideline does not exist and you'd, you'd move to the next, le to the next method. The overfill inspection must be performed by a UST service technician. That technician needs their ICC certification as a California UST service technician. They need to have be working under a contractor's license or a tank tester's license. In addition to that, they need to be certified or trained in the method that they're, they're conducting the inspection. That, that certification can come from either the manufacturer of the equipment, teaching them how to perform a proper inspection, um, or the developer of the inspection method. Now, if neither of those, if the manufacturer doesn't offer training, or if there's the, the, the developer of the method doesn't offer training, then some other sort of comparable training can be used. And that would be something that would be uh, approved by the COOPA, and you would want that comparable training or certification to be on similar equipment or for similar equipment. This is all intended to produce reliable and repeatable results. Um, further, those results of the overfill prevention inspection need to be documented on the overfill prevention equipment uh, inspection report form. Um, again, a copy of the procedures should be attached to that, to that report form so that when it's submitted to the regulator, the regulator, regardless of whether they actually attended that inspection, would have an idea of, of what activities were actually done at the site to make this determination of whether it was a passing or failing inspection. Also, any documentation that is necessary for the method used to de make that determination needs to be uh, submitted. So, for example, um, to determine where the equipment is set in the tank, uh, any calculations that are, would be required to actually make that determination. Tank charts would be very, very helpful and useful, almost critical in this, ma in, in this manner to actually be able to know where exactly is those uh, percentage of capacity that that equipment is set at. Again, a link to these reports will be at the end of our, our uh, presentation. This, uh, this form also needs to be submitted to the COOPA within 30 days of, of performing the inspection, and the owner-operator uh, needs to retain a copy for 36 months. Moving on to spill container testing, we've required that for many years. Um, the, the interval has not changed. Uh, it is required every 12 months. However, we now also require that that spill bucket or spill container be tested um, within 30 days after a repair. What we're looking for with this test is that it would demonstrate that the container can contain a spill until detected and cleaned up. So again, there's your, t your, your testing criteria, and if it can contain that, contain, you know, the spill or, or during the test, if it's determined that it can contain a spill until detected and cleaned up, that's a passing result. Um, just like we've seen before in overfill prevention inspections and also secondary containment testing, the way that you determine what methods should be used for this testing is, uh, is a hierarchical order, that it should be either a manufacturer guideline that is being used first, and if those don't exist, then using an industry code or engineering standard such as PEI 1200. Again, if you have a unique system, and PEI does not actually cover those types of, 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 of components, then moving on to a method of, that is developed or approved by a state registered professional engineer can be used. Um, again, if 
the manufacturer guidelines or industry code don't actually um, address the criteria, which is that the spill container is tight and that it would contain a spill and that until it's removed, um, it's as if it doesn't exist, so you would move to the next method. We've defined who should actually be doing spill container testings, um, and that testing should be performed by a UST service technician, again, with an ICC certification working in a, under a contractor's license or under a tank tester license, and have some sort of training or certification um, to show that they are knowledgeable in how to perform that test. That, that certification and training can either come from the manufacturer of, of the equipment being tested, the developer of the test method, or the developer of the testing equipment being used to perform the test. Um, and again, if those training or certifications doesn't come from any one of those entities, some type of comparable training. And that would look like some other manufacturer that does have uh, guidelines on that type of testing, or some other similar test, such as um, some tests that could be applied to, to secondary containment, like a hydrostatic test in a sump and a hydrostatic test in a spill bucket are very similar and comparable. Again, this is to produce uh, reliable and repeatable results. Um, those results of the test need to be recorded on the spill container testing report form. Um, and a copy of the procedures used for that testing need to be attached along with any documentation for how that determination was made. Again, if it's a, it's a vacuum test on the spill container, it, it would be an initial vacuum reading, a, a duration that, that, that was between the readings, and a final reading. Uh, moving into corrosion protection equipment, testing and inspection. Um, this was actually not a new requirement, but it was a requirement that we did not have in our regulations, so felt it was appropriate to add it so that we could say we are at least as stringent as the federal requirements. Um, so filled installed systems tested by, uh, need to be tested by a, a, corrosion, and a corrosion specialist. Um, and so we're talking about a system would, that would be a system such as impressed current. Um, if it is a pre-engineered system, a uh, corrosion protection system, um, it needs to be checked by a factory authorized repair service, and that would be something like a sacrificial anode. Um, there is no required form to, deter to, uh, to record the results of, of this test on or inspection. So um, whatever the tester or an inspector feels is appropriate and actually demonstrates that, that it's an operational system is adequate. Uh, monitoring system certification, um, there was a couple items that was added to what needs to occur during a certification, and these were words that were in the federal requirement that we did not have in our requirements. Um, they wanted that to ensure that, that the floats move freely on equipment that have floats, such as the ATG probe, uh, interstitial sensors like a 208 sensor, um, anything that could bind up. Um, they want to ensure that the person performing that certification is uh, ensuring that it can move freely. Um, inspecting for kinks or breaks in the cable. Obviously, if there are breaks in the cable, that equipment's not going to work, um, and kinks could become problematic. And so if kinks are found, they need to be taken out. But it's, it's something that could lead to a failure and, and was included, is now included in the inspection. Um, checking the monitoring, monitoring panel's backup battery was a specific action that the federal, rec feds, federal regulations uh, pointed out. Um, obviously, if a panel does not have a backup battery, that site's not subject to this requirement. Um, and finally, the inspection of containment sumps for damage, debris, or liquid. Um, we, we generally have a DO look in a containment sump when there's been an alarm, but the federal requirements did want containment sumps checked on an annual basis. We felt that it was appropriate to add that requirement to the annual monitoring certification because we could guarantee that the sumps would be open at that time and it would uh, cause less impact on our program by requiring it there. Um, these requirements are driven by the uh, monitoring, certifications, monitoring system certification form 
Um, these are not something that you're going to find in the text of the regulation. So those requirements that I just went over, you're going to find that have been added to our to the revised form. Also, what we've added to the, the revised monitoring system certification form was we added the addendum that had been available as a courtesy by the State Water Board that addresses vacuum, vacuum pressure and hydrostatic monitored systems. Um, so that, that was appended to the end of, of the report. So the revised form must be used at this point. Um, Again, that's something that's submitted to the COOPA within 30 days of, of the certification. And we have links to that form at the end of our presentation. Moving on to the designated UST operator visual inspection. Uh, we've had a change where it's gone from a monthly inspection to an inspection at least once every 30 days. Uh, the big driving factor for that was that the federal requirements wanted this inspection to be done on a regular interval. Um, in the past, requiring it to be uh, done monthly allowed that interval to fluctuate, um, and we thought the best way to actually address this issue was to adopt the language verbatim. Um, also, they wanted uh, damage to be included in something that the designated operator is looking for. Um, and so we've added that requirement that in addition to liquid and debris in these areas that spill containers under dispenser containment and containment sumps would also be evaluated for damage by the designated operator. Um, I do want to point out that containment sumps are only needed to be checked when there has been an alarm during the la since the last inspection and there's no record of a service visit. So if, if the designated operator can't find any record that a UST service technician was called out or a contractor, then they do have a requirement to open up that containment sump and inspect it, make sure that the leak detection equipment is where it should be, make sure that there's no debris or liquid in that containment sump. In addition, um, inspection for obstructions in the fill pipe. Um, if you went to John Elkins' session, we had a, a good discussion about uh, when you find a stick in a fill pipe, whether that's a violation or not. Um, the federal requirements in, insist that the DO uh, look for that and make note of that. Um, whether it's a uh, violation would come down to something like, well, is it actually interfering with the flapper valve? Um, in, in any case, it needs to be noted. There may be no action to actually take, but it needs to be noted so that we know whether whether there's, there's an issue with that happening. Also, uh, the designated operator is required to verify that the fill cap fits securely on the fill pipe. And you ask, what does securely fit on the fill pipe? Well, that it's present, it's there, and it's latched on there. Um, I, I understand that the Air Board also has a requirement to, to check for, for fill caps and that they're on securely, and uh, I, they probably have a more rigorous process of actually making sure that that, that seals for air quality needs. Um, we we want to make sure that all tanks have a cap and that it's in, in, the, in position. So this inspection, uh, the results of it must be recorded on the designated UST operator visual inspection report. Um, And that visual inspection report is to be retained on site for 36 months. Um, any records? And so the way that we document these, these inspections have changed now. Um, before, uh, there was a form out there provided as a courtesy. Um, and it addressed all the needs that a, the, that a designated operator needed to be concerned about. Uh, and But the federal walkthrough inspection asked for something more. It wasn't enough that the inspection was just being conducted. They actually wanted the issues that were discovered to be rectified immediately. We've had a DO program in place since 2005. Um, we've always had the DO program be an observe and report program. Um, the designated operator does not necessarily have the authority to manipulate the system, so we had to come up with some way of making sure that we had requirements that the person that has the authority to actually do something to the system and correct the issues that are found could actually do something about it and was aware of it. Um, 
And so the owner operator needs to provide a description of any issues uh, found at the, at the site and recorded on the, on the document. Uh, the owner operator would then sign the document and date it showing that they were made aware whether there were issues or not. I've had a lot of people ask me, well, if there aren't compliance issues, does the owner operator still need to sign the form? Yes, they do. Um, they need to be aware of the status of their site and no, no compliance issues is also being aware of the status of their site. Um, another activity that is a little bit extra is so that things that were discovered during the last inspection don't slip through the, cra through the cracks. The designated operator needs to review the last inspection report and look for documentation that sh according to the description that was provided on that report as far as what the owner operator was going to do to, to then find documentation and attach it to the new report so that they can cross that out off the list as, as being addressed. If they're not able to do that, that, that compliance issue needs to roll over to the current inspection form. And this is a way that we don't have issues that were discovered just fall through the cracks and not ever be addressed. And facility employee training. Um, the, the federal requirements uh, have implemented a class A, B, and C operator requirement. Uh, we were able to look at what we had in place and, and uh, find uh, similitude between our DO program, our owners and operators, and our facility employees to justify not having to move to a class A, B, and C operator uh, requirement. So. In order to have similitude with the two programs, we had to change some things with our facility employee and training. Uh, the training used to be required within 30 days of the date of hire at the facility. Now employees that are responsible for the duties of a facility employee must be trained before, before they actually execute their responsibilities. Um, the training has to be site specific, which means that the designated operator is not able to just make a video that they sit people down in front of and expect them to learn everything that they need to to be a, a facility employee. That could be a component of their training, but um, there needs to be, they need to know where the, what their responsibilities are at that specific site and how to execute them. In addition, they, the, the federal requirements wanted some sort of a initial training to include a practical dem demonstration so a practical demonstration is, uh, is uh, a sharing of knowledge and, and finding out whether that person actually understood what, what you were teaching them. So it's not so much as telling them that if there's a spill out at the pump, just throw absorbent on the puddle and then sweep it up later. It's showing them where the absorbent is stored, how to, how to distribute it, and how to clean it up later and properly dispose of it. Um, where, where the emergency contact numbers are, where the telephone is, um, that, is, that is a requirement for initial training. Once the person has been initially trained, on-the-job experience should actually increase their ability to, to perform their duties. This training is documented on the Facility Employee Training Certificate, which is a required document to use to, uh, to demonstrate training's been done. One of the federal requirements was that the, the training that the training that someone received would be signed, would, would the documentation for the training someone would receive would be signed by the trainer. Um, so we ended up creating this certificate. The certificate has the ability to add multiple people to that certificate so that you can do mass, so that mass trainings can be done. And the date that the, the the date and the signature on the bottom of the form indicate when, indicates when the training has occurred. So every 12 months, everyone that's been listed on that form needs to have gone through training again so that they can be considered a facility employee. Um, that form obviously only needs to be retained for 12 months and, and on site. Um, after that 12 months, those employees should show up on another certificate. Um, if more training is required throughout the year, um, another certificate is filled out by the DO, including the individuals that they trained. This, this document is also going to be available through a link at the end of our presentation. Okay. 
So we have a few other requirements that are kind of oddballs. They really didn't fit in anywhere. Um, if, you have, if you're going to do some VEDO zone monitoring or some groundwater monitoring, you know, what, why not switch up your monitoring right before you pull out your tank? Um, but if someone decides that, that they are going to mo monitor their single wall tank through VEDO zone monitoring or groundwater monitoring, a site assessment is required, and that site assessment is required to be, to be uh, performed by a professional engineer or geologist. Um, and finally, closure samples. That those samples and the results, the, the results of the samples need to be retained by the owner or operator for 36 months after closure. Um, those could either be retained by the Coupa or by the owner operator if the facility is not, if the facility is going to still exist afterwards. Um, but it is the owner and operator's response, the owner or operator's responsibility to hang on to those samples to demonstrate that they actually did the sampling that they were required. Uh, this is a list of resources that you have out there to get a little bit better idea of, of some a better idea of what the federal requirements require, what their intentions were behind it, and also what the state state water board requires for California's UST program. Um, so we have a link to the forms right up on top, and so that'll take you to all the required forms that you, that must be used at this point. Um, we have been turning out. Uh, local guidance letters for a while and we have uh, a big job ahead of us of revising those so that they're accurate with the new requirements. In the meantime, we are providing informational documents and these are documents that are a set of series. They all look the same except in their title. Um, it's a question and answer format that's supposed to help uh, answer any questions about what is expected for meeting these new requirements. Um, so far, we've, we have a couple more documents to draft, but at this time, we have an overfill inspection document, an emergency generator tank system line leak detector requirement document, spill container testing um, informational document, an informational document on secondary containment testing, and an informational document on new construction, upgrade, and compatibility requirements. Um, we have, we were working hard to get, a, get our designated operator requirement informational document done before the COOPA conference. It didn't get done. It's a very large document. It has three or four parts. Um, and, and we're trying to be very thorough in explaining how those requirements should be met. Um, so expect to see that coming out in the next uh, couple weeks. Make sure that you're signed up for our LIRIS list. If you go to the UST homepage, right up on top, there's a link to uh, sign up for our listserv. Um, and that's how we communicate with you guys. It's, it's our first line of defense um, to, to get information out. So we have US EPA guidance documents that have been published, and there's a link to those. They have a, uh, about four or five different documents. Um, one of them is uh, the last link here, must for us. Um, that's a really great, a great document because it, it summarizes the, the new federal requirements and what the feds um, are expecting to happen to, out in the field. Um, the US EPA also has frequently asked questions, um, and they have a technical compendium just for the 2015 revisions. Um, so with that, um, that wraps up our presentation. If you have any questions about uh, that you want to ask after after you leave, have left the conference, you can either contact Tom Henderson or myself. This is our contact information. Um, Tom likes to feel like Sisyphus and constantly push that stone up the hill, so please call him. <laughs> but thank you very much for attending our presentation, and we'll take any questions.